Thanks, Ewan. Um, yeah, so I'm PJ Piper. I'm with Far UV uh, Technologies. Oh, I'm Bill Palmer with Aeromed. I've been involved with filtration and. Thank you. Been involved in filtration and uh, ventilation since the early 80s, and then with upper room UV since the 90s. And I have to say that a year ago, uh, or two years ago, I would have said, the podium's not big enough for 222 and 254. Indeed, indeed. But some of us learn, we move on, and now we're married. So, uh, <laughs> we want to, we <laughs> yes, yes. We want to we want to thank everybody who brought us together over the the Johns Hopkins meetings and the the influenza conference and 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 some of that. So it's 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 super interesting, and that really leads me um, to reiterate that this is beyond far UV. It's all UV, and it's also UV and filtration and ventilation. Because the only way we're going to be a part of the discussion at the scale is if we're really addressing clean air as as a whole indoors. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our methodologies, both past, present, and future. It's There's been an evolution of it, um, some of that because of testing capabilities, some of it now because of code changing um, uh, in there. Um, we're not going to, this is not a talk about all commissioning or installation. We fully support Namco's efforts to get all of the manufacturers and all the installers on the same page. Can't reference that enough. I think, how's this work? I just press the green dot. Oh, further up. You mean the one with the arrow? Yeah. That, these, that these new technology guys, I don't know. So, so um, top one uh, picture, you've seen it on the CDC website. This is Bill's baby. What do you, what do you have to say about this? Well, I think everyone here is pretty familiar with upper room and how it works. We irradiate the upper portion of the room and rely on both mechanical and uh, uh, convection currents to get the uh, pathogens up into the disinfection zone. It's it's pretty simple science. We've been doing it forever. How, how do you do it? So the main difference with, with whole room, of course, is we're in, in and around all the people. Right, um, and so here's an example in a military installation. We were funded by NASA Department of Defense, so we're very active in the military all the way up through the Pentagon. Obviously, the the, the old sepia pictures are are awesome to kind of show that this has been around for eighty, almost a hundred years. As well as when you walk through airports now, you're going to see it more often in airports. Somebody actually brought up the airport airplane question before, and just as an aside, uh, to be a first tier provider. For the airline industry, you have to have a three hundred million dollar insurance policy, product liability insurance. So there are some limitations in what we can do directly, directly on airplanes. However, Boeing's very active, and actually, we got involved after we saw a seven eighty seven um, example in an airplane bathroom. So seven eighty sevens better better than other 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 options as you're flying, or at least when you go to the bathroom, unless you hold it. Um, so. Uh, while we've done a lot of different applications, one of our favorites um, uh, has been the Club Cafe in Boston. And um, as you all saw last night, Ed has an affinity for singing, and and this is his this is his favorite place to sing. And he had a premise saying, "Can we create the safest place to sing or hear singing in the world?" And this was in 2021. I think we were in the middle of Delta. We were probably easing into Omicron, because that was fun. Um, and and we said, yeah, let's take this on. Um, so Ushio and Far UV um, donated fixtures um, um, to get in this. And so it's a good example of how dosing has changed, um, or our methodologies of dosing has, has changed um, through going. So originally, and even to this day, the first thing we always do is we can you get a floor plan? Can we get an example of the floor plan so we can see just how much area we're looking at and also volume? So ideally we can get ceiling heights. So if we look at, I don't know what the arrow is. The bottom button? Ah, there we go. Okay, that makes sense too. Um, so ceiling heights will indicate how much area a given lamp will expose to, but then within the product, and this is an interesting thing that we've, we, we've, you know, not every fixture that uses a given light source is the same. So just because 
Bill's unit is maybe using a, a, a lamp from one manufacturer, the design of the lamp has a profound impact. What diffusers are chosen? What filters are chosen? Um, what is the power supply that drives it? It's not all the same. And it's kind of, I don't think it's a secret. It's just not something we've really gone through. I like the labeling efforts that we're doing with NEMA, where you're going to actually have that specifically noted on each product. Um, but in our case, um, some of the differences are that when you have a diffuser, now a diffuser knocks down the power, but it also widens it out. Well, on a short ceiling, that's actually great because you want to get more coverage and more, more, more disinfection in that space. On a taller ceiling, when you're dealing with 11, 12 foot ceilings, that diffuser actually takes it out versus sending it all the way to the floor. And now as ASHRAE 241 is defining the breathing zone of three inches to 72 inches, that matters because we're gonna be defined our performance on that. So there's a lot of distinctions. The other thing is, is when we were looking at this originally, uh, we were focusing on percentage disinfection. That was, the, that was the easier way. This was the log kill, right? We believe the market's going toward ACH. And that's because we wanna follow the golden rule and we wanna use the language that the people who determine the rules so we can fit in their paradigm. So I think EACH, equivalent ACH is the way to go. Um, this area up here was the Napoleon room. That's where the singing actually happens. So one important thing to notice here is you're like, oh, wow, this is, this is a pretty big space for only two lights, right? Well, we, we always dosed on the basis of, well, how much does somebody have to spend? Is it better to get six incremental ACH or 10 incremental ACH versus a budget that can't afford any of it and they walk away? Well, no. So we would often tie it to that. In this case, though, Ed said, I want my room really, really protected, right? So we put in, this is the highest amount we put in into one space would be six units where it was about 200 square feet per unit, especially with the Krypton 36, where you're gonna have this very high ACH. So we were targeting over 50 air changes per hour equivalent in this room. Now that made sense because if you're singing, there's more emissions, right? And so it made a lot of sense to do that. But here's another important thing, and this kind of ties back into the whole other questions of chemistry and a lot of that. Um, you know, some of the chemistry uh, citations we're looking at 45 microwatts, right? Um, the highest we can actually go with the threshold limit value is 15. But where we are in here, we're at like one, maybe a half a microwatt, right? In here, we're probably at two. So the difference is, is in some of the cited amounts of chemistry, we have to remember those are sometimes an order or two orders of magnitude more than we're actually doing in practice. This is an important point to realize so people don't scare people into thinking, well, what about the stuff that's already in there? It's a fraction of what's being uh, being being looked at. So this is, this is kind of how we approached it. Um, and then what was really interesting is um, Columbia and, and, and Ed followed up with the film dosimetry to say, well, how much actually was there? And this is more of a safety related thing. Like, well, how much dose did they actually get? And it, and it takes into account this time-weighted averaging concept. Well, within the 30 subjects, we saw if somebody's sitting, they're getting less dose. If somebody's uh, standing, they're getting a higher dose. Uh, and actually we got pretty darn close to our target of 50 EACH um, according to this study. Maybe that goes into Holger's concept if, this, if, if the results match, that's a, that's a good scenario. Um, <laughs> however, um, it's also very important to realize we were testing on the expected K value of SARS-CoV-2. And that, that was related to the question uh, that was in Catherine's um, presentation on how would we be against MS-2? Well, we're about 10 times better against mammalian viruses, COVID, influenza, et cetera, than we are against an MS-2. Fortunately, we don't have an MS-2 pandemic upon us. And there is some question on what's the next one. And that's where I think it's a good handoff to, to Bill. Move over, buddy. <laughs> Let me tell you how I would do it. So if I was doing this back when PJ was in high school and I was laying out UV systems, I would have looked at... <laughs> How many 200 square foot areas do I have here and putting 30 watts of total UV power into those 200 square foot spots? But like everything, as we gain in knowledge, we adapt, we change our, our process. So now I would look at it at 
uh, in re regard to the GPC 37 guidelines based on the South Africa TB study, where I know that I'm going to be getting about 24 equivalent air changes if I use a dosing strategy of 12 milliwatts per meter cubed. So I've shown different size uh, isoplets or whatever you would call it to uh, show what size equipment that I would put into the rooms. And I pretty much would put these into the rooms regardless of what was happening within those spaces, knowing that I'm already getting somewhere in that 24 equivalent air changes an hour. The problem, of course, is that this was a study done on TB and we think that we're much more effective on SARS-CoV-2 than we would be on TB. So, of course, we think we're doing much better than this and we have to come up with a way in the near future to show how much better we're doing than the 24. But right now, I really can't stray up or down from this. If I put much more in there, we've already shown that I'm really not getting any additional benefit. If I put much less in there, I'm not really sure what it's going to do to my effectiveness. But even with this change that's recent, there's going to be another change. So let's look at the 241. So with 241, now we're changing again, and we're looking at equivalent clean air per infection uh, per person, as opposed to looking at the dosing criteria that we were showing before. Now, in almost every setting, when I apply the 24 expected air changes an hour that I'm getting with upper room 254, I'm going to meet or exceed the requirements of the 241P. But then the 241P is based on 62.1 occupancy density as opposed to fire safety density. So here at, at the club cafe, we had a fire safety occupancy of 433 but an ASHRAE 62.1 occupancy of 260. So now if I have to bump up that ventilation, uh, the, the clean air, uh, the equivalent clean air rate to match the actual occupancy, I'm gonna be above 24. So I either have to show how 254 is doing better than the 24 that I'm getting, or I have to start adding some things together. So, I mean, I'm looking at, at this and what do we do in the future? How do we bring these things into balance? Well, and so so that's where you might add HEPA filters. You might add far UV, right? And these things can be additive. But but here's where I think it gets interesting. We haven't really talked about cost. Who, Paul, you mentioned cost. What's the cost difference? And what's the efficacy difference? So we've already known that that the efficacy of, of UV is significantly higher than either ventilation or filtration as 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 typically installed. You might get five ACH equivalent out of a filter, but it's usually on the high setting and everybody turns that down or they talk over it and potentially emit more in the room than they're getting rid of, but it's a different story. Um, ventilation is extremely expensive. How expensive? How expensive is it? Well, a lot of it's in the energy use. Mechanical movement, the, the company I had before UV was actually an electric fan motor company. It's It's been a mission on the Department of Energy um, for 30 years, to reduce to reduce energy usage, but the reality is is you're kind of capped right around where you are. So the whole COVID thing of everybody stay inside and you know all the rest of this it flew right in the in in the face of of, of the energy goals. Um, but here's where UV plays a big role, and this is going to be a determinant for the use of UV over other stuff because what 241P does is it recommends clean your air. You'll be able to decide how to get there. Well, if you have a decision to use something and it's either going to use 160 watts or 15 watts, 15 sounds better, right? Especially when it's actually giving you anywhere from two to, to five times better, better efficacy. And by the time you actually factor in the cost of installation, the cost of maintenance on it, you're looking at, at about an order of magnitude lower cost to use UV. That's going to be a driver. And that's a message, if we can get it out through IUVA or, or all the rest of it, I think is going to be a big thing. Um, so I've only got a minute. We have an extra slide. We were going to kind of talk about the, the 433 people. It's less, it's less important. But, but look at this. I mean, if you're, if you're going to go back into that club cafe and say, okay, now go into compliance with 241P, it might cost you a million dollars. Or can you have somebody come in in one day and put it in for 50000 and qualify? 
It's a big difference. Incremental. Not to mention the fact that uh, you don't want loud fans going on when you're listening to Ed's beautiful voice uh, on, on that. So, or, or having, you know, units in the floor. There's pros and cons of all this stuff, right? Everybody has a little bit of a different benefit. And I think it's going to be a layered approach that works for different applications. Thank you.